Hey guys, Ash here with another Ray Shadow Legends Champion Guide, this time on Abyssal, one of my favorite Demon Spawn rares, one of my favorite rares, honestly, in the game. This little fella grew on me. Hopefully he will you as well. First, a few shoutouts to you guys. Drunken Estarte coming through with a lot of requests, a lot of them here, uh, along with many others looking for a guide on this little rare champion. Let's go ahead and take a look at what makes him so unique, especially for a rare in the game. So I remember when Abyssal first came out, and I was I was kind of underwhelmed by his kit. I did not go out there, even though I pulled him uh, really soon after he was released. I did not go out there and max him for, I think, probably like a year, right? But I'm glad that I finally did. Uh, he's one of those rare champions who's a rare <laughs> exception to the rule where their best use case, at least in my opinion, for Abyssal isn't actually the early game. I think you start using this champion a lot more as you progress towards actually the end game of Raid Shadow Legends. So that may inform what type of player wants to invest in this rare champion out the gate here. So his speed is about average for a rare at 95, maybe a little bit below. Defense about average at 1,000. His attack is at 815, very low. And then his HP is pretty decent at over 18,000, again, for a rare support. On his A1, it is Void Gaze. It's an AoE attack. We have a 30% chance of placing a block buffs when booked on the A1. So immediately out the gate, we see AoE on the A1. We're excited about it, right? So especially with the block buffs, too, that can be very helpful in a lot of wave content. Think about how many, you know, disgusting Valkyrie waves there are out there. Have to deal with a counterattack and deal with that big shield. Uh, think about the man eaters of the world, right? Obviously, with the unkillables, it can be super annoying. He can place those block buffs. Obviously, it's not at a super high land rate, but with Sniper, it can be a 35%. Not too bad. It's better than nothing on that. AoE on the A1. Obviously, that has a great synergy with the stun set as well on this champion. On the A2, Abyssal Renewal, it's a very simple ability. It heals all allies 15% of their max HP. Listen, it's not the strongest heal in the world. It's not based on his max HP, but rather the allies' max HP. We prefer his HP. That way, we can scale it as high as possible. But still, it is a heal, uh, an AoE heal at that. On the A3, Wards of Madness, on a four turn cooldown, we have the weak version of increased defense and the weak version of increased attack on the same ability on all allies for two turns this is another one of those abilities that initially i kind of scoffed at you know oh the weak version of these buffs oh it's on a four turn not a three turn cooldown that kind of sucks but it's hard to find these buffs at all especially in rare only content in the game so you know oftentimes every team that i use abyssal on let's put it this way he ends up being my main buffer because I don't have anybody else on the team. Maybe with Tree Shield, not with the increased defense, but it's really few and far between that you can get these buffs from rare champions. So it's really nice that he has that. You put it all together with speed and faction crypts. You got a great faction crypt progression champion, and you have a great control champion on your hands who can also heal and buff your team at the same time. Again, weak version of buffs, but it's kind of like looking at Bellower and saying, ah, weak version of debuffs. You know, 75% of the time, it's buffs are better than no buffs, and debuffs are better than no debuffs, and it can be hard to find some of these. So it's nice that he has both of the essential buffs, so to speak, with the increased defense, increased attack, just missing that increased speed too, and you'd be good to go. Uh, but overall, we have a really robust support and control rare champion on our hands. Uh, it's probably not going to come to a surprise to you guys how I have him built. His best use case, in my opinion, he's, he's, he's pretty niche. I'm not going to lie to you guys. Not a rare that you're going to be using like Coltar everywhere in the game or a Bellower or anything like that. Uh, but for Cursed City, this is why I mentioned Endgame. For Cursed City, he's available in quite a few areas. A great stun set candidate. And for secret rooms, there's a lot of spirit only rare secret rooms or just rare only secret rooms in Doom Tower. He's great there as well. And I already mentioned anywhere Doom Tower waves or faction wars, even dungeon progression that you just need some control in a stun set and a little bit of healing as well. So he's a pretty versatile champion in progression, although not great in any one area. And then in the end game, he's actually great at control in a support to boot so we have him in a speed in a stun set i think the perfect set breakdown for him would actually be stun and retaliation if you have an aoe on the a1 champion in a stun set 
you might as well throw him in a retaliation too. I didn't have retaliation gear lying around for this build, but it gives him a 15% chance to counterattack, thus another shot, 18% at landing that stun. Thus, in Abyssal's case, another 30% chance or 35% chance of placing that block buffs as well on enemies, right? So it's a nice synergy there. Heck, I have stun in speed. That works as well. You could also run, you know, stun in immortal or stun in life gear. Kind of a flex uh, option there. The bummer on this champion is kind of the, the thing that makes him pretty cool about having that block buffs on the A1 is it's the only reason that we need accuracy to land the pretty low land rate of block buffs. So you have the decision to make. Do you really want to prioritize accuracy? If so, go with an accuracy set, go with it a, a perception set, uh, or you can just go, you know, with, with speed like I do here. I would definitely rather have that. I mean, look at this build. We have 163 accuracy. I mean, we could put that over 200, right? 203 if we picked up the, uh, the the accuracy set or the or the perception set. So I would much rather perception than speed is what I'm trying to say. But this is what we got here in today's video. We have HP on the uh, on the banner. You know what I'm gonna do, guys? I'm gonna remove that HP. I love the survivability. Don't get me wrong. 6,000 HP is a ton. However. Let's do the correct thing and actually build him with enough accuracy to dependably land uh, that A1, those debuffs, because frankly, it's a really good debuff to have, block buffs, uh, for reasons that we've already mentioned, right? So priority stra uh, stat, excuse me, let's go with accuracy, and then, uh, sure, we'll go ahead and put a supersonic accuracy banner on him. Now, all is right in the world. Accuracy on the banner. I have crit damage on the amulet. I have HP survivability on the ring. I do have crit rate on the gauntlets on this champion. I have attack percentage on the chest, and I have speed on the boots. However, and this is a big however here, the multipliers are very, very, very weak when it comes to this champion. You're not looking at a lot of damage from him. If he was dying in any situation that I was using him in, any situation, if he's coming close to death, I would easily just go ahead and put an HP percentage on the chest and put HP percentage or defense percentage, I guess, on the uh, on the gauntlets, right? Probably one of each. Survivability, first and foremost, especially on this champion because the damage is not that great. That being said, we did build him for a little bit of damage because, hey, he is surviving in the areas that I'm using him. So we have 92, 145 with the crit rate and the crit damage on the gauntlets and the amulet, as I already showed you guys. 249 on the accuracy, 216 on the speed. Stat priorities on Abyssal are going to be that speed, accuracy, survivability, and then if you can build in some damage, go ahead and do so. We do have him awakened, and we have Phantom Touch on him as well. Uh, kind of limited in terms of rare uh, uh, blessings, obviously. But I feel like, honestly, you know, a lot of them do can make sense given how you're using this champion. I will say, Faultless Defense probably is is a better option than phantom touch now that they've reworked these blessings right whenever whenever an enemy attacks an ally under increased defense placed by this champion reflects a portion of the damage back to the attacker and you know we only have him two star awakened so it's three percent of the damage reflected at three stars it would be six percent that's a, mu a much more juicy and then 15 all the way down at six star i think faultless defense is actually the way to go now for abyssal because he does have the increased defense defense uh weak version still works the same on the faultless defense blessing uh for masteries we don't have any <laughs> but here's how i would build him by the way hellhades.com massive shout out to the website they give him a 2.5 overall score you know he's these niche it's hard to grade this champion right uh if you're looking for control out of a rare spirit affinity rare he's a five out of five right depends on what you're looking for he has a 2.8 multiplier on his a1 his only attacking or damage dealing ability uh 2.8 sounds really good especially on an a1 but keep in mind his base attack is like 800 or so so not not that great this is my favorite mastery build on this champion given the build that we have on him right now a stun set right so i would absolutely come down the only thing i would say is instead of cycle of Re i would not want cycle of revenge not not that i don't want it it's helpful for the heals and whatnot but i'd probably go sniper actually uh that a1 debuff has really grown on me so since we're investing in all the accuracy masteries anyway since we're already investing in max or hexer we might as well increase the odds to a 35 percent chance especially if we already have retribution uh as well especially if you have retaliation set on him but either way we want to end with fearsome presence that's going to bump up the chances of landing the stun from the stun set from an 18 
17 to a 23% chance. And keep in mind, guys, as with every artifact set, when we're landing a debuff, aka stun in this situation, it does not require accuracy when we're doing it from an artifact set. All right, uh, let's go to... So I would use those masteries, but this is one definitely a champion, like you can see with my own build here. He doesn't really need doesn't really need masteries, you know. I mean, fearsome presence is great, but it's all RNG at the end of the day. You know, this is the annoying part of Raid Shadow Legends, in my opinion. Uh, but some of this end game content, it, it's cool because you use champions that normally you probably wouldn't be using, right? Like all of these champions, for example, and this this rare spirit champions only secret room four. That's the cool thing. The not so cool thing is that it's so RNG laden, right? And the same thing with Cursed City, Centranos, right? It's like, yeah, I just keep attacking until I land enough, uh, <laughs> until I land enough uh, stuns, basically, and then I just keep doing it over and over again. The good thing about those both of those areas, though, is you're not wasting like energy or something while you're going through the frustrating RNG. Uh, so in this situation, I let off as you guys saw with the A3. Normally, I would lead off with the A1, but everybody's already provoked. We don't really need to have them all stunned as well right now. So let's go in with Marques, who's going to be my nuker on this team. And let's just go in with Soulbond Bowyer. I do have Soulbond Bowyer. She also has an AoE on the A1. You guys are probably familiar. I have her also in a stun set, right? All right. So in this situation, we're definitely going to go with the A1 over the heal. There's not much healing that needs to be had right now, so there's no reason to go in with that heal. When in doubt, I'm going with the... Let's try to pop off somebody here. Hopefully we can kill the highest turn meter. Oh, so close. Uh, when in doubt, I'm going with the A1, right? Obviously. Same thing with Soul Bond, you know? Uh, a little bit different in Soul Bond's case because she does have like a lot of control utility out of the rest of her abilities too. But again, I'm basically evaluating, okay, do I really need a heal right now or can I just keep pushing through? Because I'd rather have a chance at landing those stuns off the A1. And that has thus far been the case. So in this situation, I can actually go A2, pop that last enemy off, and then we can A1 cycle for a little bit. Not that we really need it here. Uh, but... Take a little bit of damage there on that last one, but everybody's still pretty dang healthy. So much that we are going to be able to start the second wave exactly the same way that we started with the first wave. We'll go with Wards of Madness, his A3 ability. Now everybody has increased defense, increased attack. Hey, guess what I have on this team? I have three nukers or damage dealers. I have, uh, what the heck, who, a Berserker. Excuse me, what's, what's his name again? I have Berserker who's attack-based. And then I have uh, Soul Bond, who's attack-based. And then I have Marques, who's a defense-based nuker, but they all get extra damage because of that awesome A3 ability. And you're seeing right now how even having it on a four-turn cooldown is still incredibly useful. Why? Because I was able to cast it at the beginning of the turn. Now all of my, my champions on the team, they have all of their abilities off cooldown, so they're all going to take advantage of this ability. And by the time that we get to the third wave, the same thing is going to happen. So even though it's a four-turn cooldown, even though it's the weak version, I'm still getting, you know, a lot of utility out of it. It's not like the cooldown in this situation is really impacting me in any way. All right, so you can see right here, guys, we actually have really good situation, dealing a lot of nice damage, have everybody provoked or stunned. I can just come in here and... I don't know, it's even worth going in with the... Uh, let's A1 here. Again, we land another stun. Beautiful. Uh, let's try to pop somebody off right there in the back. There we go. We get an extra turn if we kill somebody. That's why I'm so concerned with getting the kill shot. There we go. And we can we can freeze somebody with the A3 of Marques. We'll do that in the corner back there. And then, uh, yeah, well, yeah, let's just try to land some stuns here with Soul Bond on the A1. So, you know, this one, it feels a little bit, because we have the provokes, right, on this squad as well, it feels a little bit less RNG dependent. And it's actually, you know, Fairly enjoyable to be using a bunch of champions that I don't normally use a heck of a lot on this account. Again, I'm just going to A1 cycle, use only A1 abilities here. Uh, we have good control, and then we'll have everything up and ready to refresh again on the third wave. So, we haven't even had to use the heal, which speaks to the amazing control on this team, but it also speaks to the extra damage that we're getting out of all of our damage dealers as well, so we can kill them well before they kill us. So, let's go in here. Let's see if we have to use the... Uh, let's pop him off right there. Let's see if we have to use the the heal at all. I don't think we're going to have to. Again, good contro uh, control with the... Yeah, just A1. 
with the gnarl horn provoke. And then basically, you know, we come back around and we essentially try to get back to that provoke as, as soon as possible. And we can just pick pick off the highest turn meter with the freeze of Marques and with the stun sets of the A1 from the Abyssal and from the uh from Soul Bond. Okay. So Still don't need the heal, so we go right back to the A1. No stuns that time, but things are looking pretty dang nice here. And this is the same strategy that I use basically everywhere, you know? Everywhere that I'm looking to uh, neutralize the enemy team with Abyssal or, or a rare-only team or a Curse City team. It's him and a stun set. His stuns would be more dependable, obviously. Land at a little bit of a higher rate if you do pick up that Fearsome Presence. So if you are going to go ahead and Mastery Farm or pay for the Masteries on this champion, I'd absolutely recommend you guys go ahead and invest in the fearsome presence mastery moreover i have to say this before we end the video on abyssal he absolutely does not have to be booked i mean granted the cooldowns go down on that a3 can make it you know really valuable same thing with the a2 it's one cooldown but if you're using them in a control build like this masteries are actually more important than the books, right? Because we're not really using the A2 or the A3 a heck of a lot. A3, the opening move. After that, A2, only if we need it. We didn't use it one time that battle. It'd be better just having a stun set with the A1 ability. I care so much about the block buffs. I didn't even see how many landed there uh, and get all the utility that we need out of him in that control fashion. So guys, there it is for the guide. I like this little guy. I like this little guy. Not the best rare in the game, but he's definitely full of support and control utility. And it's kind of hard to find that in a very eh, watered down rarity in the game in rares. Guys, thanks for watching till the end of the video. And as always, take care, guys.